Welcome back to Hardware Unboxed. I'm super excited about today's monitor review because once again, I get to talk about value offerings, those displays that try to hit the sweet spot between performance and price. I know you guys are all very interested in monitors on the cheaper end of the scale, so I think today's video will be of interest to you. What's on the test bench today is the Pixio PX277 Prime, their latest low-cost 1440p 165Hz IPS gaming monitor. Its older and more feature-rich brother, the PX7 Prime, has been a popular option with 1440p buyers for a while now, but the PX277 Prime is bringing those same specs to an even more competitive price point in an attempt to defeat ViewSonic's hold on the throne with their VX27582 KP MHD. You may have heard that alphabet soup of a product name a few times on this channel because we talk about it and recommend it quite a bit, so having a competitor in this space is pretty exciting. In terms of price, the PX277 Prime is hitting the market with a price tag of $330 US dollars. I believe right now it's up for pre-order, not 100% sure if that will still be the case by the time this review goes live, but anyway, this is a very new product. This makes the PX277 around $70 cheaper than the PX7 Prime, and essentially the same price as the ViewSonic competitor, so in general we're looking at one of the cheapest 1440p high refresh rate IPS monitors on the market. How has Pixio been able to take what they offered with the PX7 Prime and bring it to a lower price point? Well, there have been some trade-offs. One is the color gamut, which isn't as wide with the new PX277, and we'll talk about that later. The other is the stand, which is no longer height adjustable. That's not a huge deal given the VX27582 KP MHD isn't height adjustable either, but where the PX7 has a great stand for ergonomics, the PX277 gives you just a fixed height with tilt support, although there is VESA mounting compatibility. The overall build quality though is quite good, with a mixture of a metal stand and plastic display housing. I think this monitor looks great from the front and equally great from the back. There are some patterns here, but overall it's a simple design that works well. No need for wasting money on RGB or other unnecessary crap with a budget display. This design is meant to get the job done, and it does exactly that. The port selection is basic but sufficient with a single DisplayPort 1.2 port along with two HDMI 2.0 inputs and an audio output jack. To access this monitor's 165Hz refresh rate, you'll need to be using DisplayPort as HDMI is capped to 144Hz. All three ports support adaptive sync variable refresh rates though, and with low frame rate compensation there is effectively no minimum refresh. While Pixio have used a directional toggle here for controlling the OSD, and I do appreciate that, it is positioned a bit awkwardly here. Not too bad to use once you're familiar with the location, but it's certainly a non-conventional position. In the OSD, we get a standard range of features such as color controls and a few gaming specific features like a timer, cheat crosshairs, and a refresh rate display. So Pixio is pretty competitive here on features. Nothing groundbreaking, but you're also not missing out on key functionality. We're getting four overdrive modes with this display, similar to previous Pixio displays, so let's see how this panel performs. Using the off mode, which is overdrive disabled, we see native panel performance around the 11 millisecond mark. That's okay for an IPS, but clearly well short of what is required for 165Hz gaming. The low mode is the default mode, and here we do see improved performance, now up to a greater gray average of 8.20 milliseconds. While overshoot is virtually non-existent here, response times aren't quite fast enough to keep up with that 165Hz refresh rate without introducing smearing, so we'll need to keep pushing up the overdrive mode here. The middle mode is where we hit acceptable performance at the maximum refresh rate. A 5.36 millisecond greater gray average is pretty good, and that leads to 80% of transitions being fast enough to keep up with the 165Hz refresh. However, this is kind of unusual response time performance, with some sections of the table performing really well with sub 3 millisecond responses, and others lagging behind at beyond 10 milliseconds. We also see some areas of quite significant overshoot, and others with no overshoot at all. It's not often that you see performance like this, but it was consistent throughout my testing. As for the high overdrive mode, we only see a small 1 millisecond improvement here versus the middle mode at the expense of increased overshoot, so I can't imagine this will be the favourite mode for gaming. While the middle mode is well suited to gaming in the upper end of the refresh range, around the 165 to 144 hz range, performance does fall away when refresh rates aren't as high. At 120Hz, overshoot increases to the point where 25% of transitions exhibit noticeable inverse ghosting, which is an ugly artifact to deal with. And while performance remains around the 5 millisecond mark as we move even lower in refresh rate, overshoot continues to increase, and especially below 100Hz becomes very obvious. 
What this means is that if you're playing more in the 60 to 100 FPS range with variable refresh enabled, you'll want to turn down the monitor to the low overdrive setting. We do lose that top end to performance with the PX277 becoming more of a 120Hz display in this mode, but performance remains solid enough at lower refresh rates, and although we do regress to around a 7ms average response time, this display is much more usable at lower refresh rates in this mode. Like many monitors, this analysis shows the PX277 Prime does not have a single overdrive mode that's suitable for all refresh rates. The optimal settings are either the middle mode, above 120Hz, or the low mode for below 120Hz. So you'll need to think about what frame rates you'll be getting in games and set your overdrive accordingly. The low mode honestly isn't too bad, but it's always disappointing that we don't get that nice set and forget single overdrive experience. And I should point out that this overdrive situation is not unique to the PX277. In fact, all of the mid-range 1440p high refresh IPS monitors that I've tested run into this same issue, whether that's the VX2758 2KP MHD, ASUS VG27AQ, or even the PX7 Prime. With most of these displays pushing their IPS panels to the limits, it's only with higher end and faster displays do we get a single overdrive mode experience. For today's comparison charts, I've stacked it with 1440p displays, so this should be handy information for making a buying decision. The PX277 Prime ends up being a mid-table option, as you'd expect from a mid-range display. This chart shows the best performance you'll get at the maximum refresh rate, and with a 5 millisecond grade grade average, this is pretty similar to other IPS monitors. The PX277 is actually a bit faster than the PX7 Prime, but not quite as fast as the VX2758 2KP MHD. With that said, the PX277 does have an advantage over most VA panels tested here, outside the much more expensive Samsung Odyssey G7. VAs tend to be slightly cheaper, so it's worth knowing that spending the extra cash on an IPS does give you better performance. Similarly, spending even more money on a 27G850 for example will elevate you into a higher performance class again. Next up, we have average performance across the refresh range. So this is the performance you can typically expect while gaming with a variable refresh rate. Almost all of the mid-range IPS monitors we've tested end up with a 7 millisecond response time average here, some with higher inverse ghosting than others, but at the end of the day, whether you choose a VX2758 2KP MHD, a VG27AQ, or a PX277 Prime, the average experience is very, very similar. The PX277 does have a higher 165Hz refresh rate compared to the VX2758's 144Hz, which may give it a slight edge here when response times are otherwise equal. No dark level smearing with the PX277 Prime, which is one reason to go IPS over VA, with the more budget offerings like the Gigabyte G27QC and AOC CQ27G2 having noticeable problems in this area. Meanwhile, for refresh rate compliance, the PX277 is decent enough with 80% of transitions being fast enough for its 165Hz refresh rate, that's similar to many other mid-range monitors of these specs, so no concerns here. The average error chart shows us how close a monitor is to maxing out the performance on offer with its panel, and we can see that Pixio are pushing this display very hard to hit its performance level. That's not always a bad thing, but we have talked about some of the downsides to this panel's performance. The PX277 is acceptable at a fixed 60Hz refresh rate, not amazing, but this is fine enough. Then for input lag, I was very impressed with the processing delay of effectively zero. We're only showing one decimal place here, but I think the more precise value for the PX277 was 0.02 milliseconds, which is very quick. It is held back a little bit by the overall refresh rate and response times compared to some of the better displays we've tested, but in general this is a very responsive display. Then for power consumption, most of the monitors here fall between 25 and 35 watts, with the PX277 splitting the middle, no cause for concern here either. Pixio does include a backlight strobing mode with this display called the MPRT mode, and surprisingly, it's not the worst implementation I've seen, however there are still double images and strobe crosstalk, so it's not a mode I'd recommend using. Let's now get into some colour performance stuff. As I mentioned, one of the main differences between the PX277 and PX7 is the colour space. The PX7 has 95% DCI-P3 coverage, whereas the PX277 is advertised with 111% sRGB. 95% P3 tends to be more like 125% sRGB or greater, so this does point to a reduced gamut for the PX277. In practice, the PX277 is 
basically just an sRGB display. I did see around 110% sRGB gamut volume, but in the more important coverage metric, which we use, 99% sRGB coverage is around 80% DCI-P3. A pure sRGB only display typically has 75 to 77% P3 coverage, so the PX277 is only slightly better. It's best to think of this as not offering a wide color gamut, and honestly, there's nothing wrong with that for a gaming monitor. My PX277 unit though was poorly calibrated from the factory with a strong blue tint. While gamma performance is very good, the wrong color tone led to a high delta E performance in grayscale as well as our color charts like saturation and color checker. While this may not be immediately noticeable out of the box, using the PX277 next to any properly calibrated display shows just how cold and blue the monitor is. However, the color temperature issues are relatively easy to fix with some OSD setting adjustments. The optimal values for my unit are seen here. With these settings, Delta E performance improved drastically for grayscale, now to the point where we are getting a sub 2.0 Delta E 2000 average and a 3.0 Delta E ITP, which is very good. This also significantly improves saturation and color checker performance again with solid Delta E results. The final steps here are of course a full calibration with an ICC profile installed. The PX277 can be quite accurate for displaying sRGB colors with an average Delta E ITP below 2.0 across all of our tests. The panel used here is inherently quite good as you'd expect from an IPS, it's just the factory calibration that was well off. Patreon members can download the ICC profile we created for this display as always. Maximum brightness is mediocre at just 300 nits, although this isn't too far below other mid-range offerings. As for contrast, bang on the expected 1000 to 1 for an IPS panel. As far as IPSs go, this is a pretty good result, but if you're a fan of deeper blacks and better contrast, which is particularly relevant for gaming in dark rooms, then VA is the way to go. Viewing angles are excellent, and we're getting a nice flat panel here, which is always my preference. Uniformity though is only average. There were some issues with the upper left corner of my panel. Dark uniformity was pretty good, and I didn't see much IPS glow, but nothing too spectacular here. Not that I'd expect so for a mid-range gaming display. When coming into this review, the main question that I wanted to answer is, if you have between $300 and $350 to spend on a 1440p monitor, should you buy the ViewSonic VX27582 KP MHD like we've been recommending for a while, or should you buy the new Pixio PX277 Prime? And after doing all of this testing and looking through the results, I think that's a pretty hard question to answer. The PX277 Prime performs exactly as expected for a mid-range IPS monitor. Response time numbers are basically the same as other offerings around this price point, so the gaming experience is no better or worse than its competitors. While the VX2758 is a little bit faster in the best cases, on average, the two monitors are very hard to split for motion clarity. If anything, I'd have to give the edge to the PX277 purely due to its higher 165Hz refresh rate. Normally I don't think this is much of a consideration given it's only a 15% higher refresh than 144Hz, but with all else equal, it does become a differentiating factor. There are lots of similarities in other areas too. Both monitors have decent enough build qualities but lack height adjustable stands, and both have similar sets of OSD features. We're also getting basically the same brightness, contrast and viewing angles. The VX2758 does have an edge in color performance. It's better factory calibrated and has a wide color gamut with 95% DCI-P3 coverage, but this does lead to oversaturation when viewing sRGB content without a full calibration. The PX277 is not good out of the box, but can be easily fixed with a few tweaks and may be a better choice when sticking to sRGB content, which is what you'll be seeing in most games. When it comes down to it, I think price and availability will be the guide for your purchase here. The ViewSonic can be hard to come by at $330, whereas the PX277 is open now for pre-orders at the same price. If in the future one is cheaper than the other, then the cheaper one might be the way to go. If both are available at the same price, then maybe I'd swing towards the PX277 due to its higher refresh rate, which I think is more relevant for gaming than a wide color gamut, but really, either option is a great choice in this price range and it's hard to go past. No major issues here, just a very solid mid-range gaming monitor at a fantastic price. That's it for this review of the Pixio PX277 Prime. As always, if you want to support our display testing, we have our Patreon page. Links are in the description below. You'll get access to our ICC profiles, uh, monthly live streams, Discord chat if you want to ask me monitor questions and all that sort of thing. Um, yeah, that's it, really. Subscribe to the channel, like this video if you enjoyed it, and I'll catch you in the next one.